Hey, everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and brought to you by official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author Mia Molson's The Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We're here with a terrific gentleman who's a retired educator with more than 30 years' experience teaching history, government, U.S. citizenship preparation, German, and English as a second language. He was born and raised in New Mexico shortly before the uh, outbreak of World War II and learned about the war and the treatment of the Jewish uh, people in Europe and developed curiosity about culture. We'll find more about that. He wrote his first book at 80, which brought together his impressions gained through a lifetime of teaching and uh, interacting with many nationalities and cultures, and uh, also has a new book out, which basically provides an account of life in Germany told from a German perspective compared to many books um, from an allied point of view. And how does that differ from that? We'll find out just one minute. Live, ladies and gentlemen, at Plus Studios in beautiful downtown Las Vegas, a retired educator, more than 30 years experience, and he's uh, got his first book, Brandenburg, A Story of Berlin, and a new book out called Brandenburg II, The Ninth Circle of Hell, and we'll find more about that. Ladies and gentlemen, the multi-talented author, James Cloud. James, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Good evening. Glad to be here. Well, it's great to have you on board, James. And uh, you're a retired educator with more than 30 years experience teaching history, government, U.S. citizenship, preparation, German and English as a second language. You were born and raised in New Mexico shortly before outbreak of World War II. You learned uh, about the war and the treatment of the Jewish um, people in Europe and developed curiosity about culture. Your, your first book at 80 brought together basically the impressions gained uh, through a lifetime of teaching and um, interact with main nationalities. And uh, you also traveled to Germany, learning the language, and you also were interpreter, British military uh, mission, and uh, got your uh, master's degree in German linguistics. And uh, at Cal State, your book is about um, providing a kind of life in Germany told from a German perspective, non ally but a German perspective. Brandenburg II, the ninth circle of hell. Before getting all that, James, tell us how you first got started. Pardon? Tell us how you first got started, all the way back. Okay, well, I have to kind of backtrack a bit. I think that the, to say how I got started probably started uh, right after World War II. Because of my age, of course, I am a generation that grew up during that time. And uh, I can remember, you know, we, during the war years, we were constantly hearing about what was going on over there. Excuse me. And uh, I had a couple of uncles who were in the military and so forth. But at the end of the war, uh, we were not happy with the Germans. We'd just gone through a big war with them. But none of us, I think, were prepared for what followed. When the newsreels came out, and we started seeing the atrocities in the camps, what we nowadays call the Holocaust. And I can remember, I was about eight years old, and I can remember people asking the question, well, what's wrong with those people? I mean, is this a flaw in German character? I mean, we were all just flummoxed, I guess you would say. How could a developed nation, even though they had been an enemy nation, and a developed modern nation like Germany degenerate to the barbarity of the Holocaust? And that question stayed with me and a lot of people of my generation throughout a lifetime. And uh, so... I, I I can remember that I was in a bit of a dilemma in my particular case. Coincidentally, I grew up in Las Vegas. Uh, excuse me. I grew up in Las Vegas, New Mexico. I now live in Las Vegas, Nevada. So. <laughs> anyway. I've never heard of that before. Las Vegas, New Mexico, Las Vegas, Nevada. and uh, I mean, what's next? Las Vegas, uh, start your own state or something? Yeah, why not? <laughs> I'm on a Las Anything's Vegas. Anything's possible these days, yeah. even Alaska. But in our little town, uh, it was kind of a unique, a unique little city because there was a large contingent of Jewish people, business owners and so forth in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and also a large contingent of German people and people of German extraction. So I grew up seeing these two groups living peaceably side by side in Las Vegas, New Mexico. And of course, the, the thought occurred to me even then, well, what happened in Europe? between these people to lead to such a catastrophe. And so that kind of started me on my road. And then of course, 
Later, I had the opportunity to go to Germany itself. I first went there in 1961 as a tourist, which was 16 years after the war. And uh, I got a little taste of, of uh, meeting Germans on their own turf, so to speak. But when I went back uh, later and lived there for five years during the Cold War years, when I went to school there and worked there too, uh, that's when I began to get to know some German people up close. Mm. Not Germans here, not e descendants of Germans, but real Germans in Germany. And of course, I, like anybody, had a lot of curiosity about what they had been doing during the war and how the Nazi years affected them and so on. Mm -hmm. And as they got to know me and felt like they could be comfortable talking about it, many never did get comfortable talking about it. I need to point that out. But right. I was people... just going to get to that part where it's just like, you know, there's a stigma that, you know, you think it come out, but many are still traumatized to this day where it's like, it's yeah. still difficult for them to talk about. It. Still right. Difficult. And and I, I, I can talk about that more later, but I now understand why people, particularly older people at that time, were very difficult to engage in a conversation about those days. And I met a variety of different kinds of people, of course, in five years, just a couple of examples um, I was in a hospital with an appendectomy at one point in a ward uh, in a few beds away from a man who had been an officer in the SS. Mm. Well, we've all heard about the SS and so right. on and so on. And I was just bursting with questions, but I didn't dare go there. I heard about him being in the SS from another patient. He didn't tell me that even himself. But anyway, and then later when I was working at Siemens in Munich, I met a a fellow who was a de design engineer. And one day he said to me, I understand you're from New Mexico. And I said, yeah, that's right. He says, I've been to New Mexico. Oh, okay. Well, this is 1972. A lot of tourists coming to the United States. So when were you in New Mexico? He kind of smiled and he said, well, from December 1944 to 1946. Uh-huh. I said, oh, yeah. I used to see you guys on the trains coming through during the war going to the prison camps. You must have been a POW. He said, that's right. Oh, wow. And he was a POW in my home state. But there's a little bit more to that story. I asked him, I said, where did the Americans pick you up? And he's, uh, you've heard of the Battle of the Hürtgen Forest outside Aachen, maybe on the uh, right on the border of Germany. And he said he it was during that time in the Battle of the Hürtgen Forest. I said, well, that's interesting because I had an uncle who was in the first infantry division of the American army. And he was in the Battle of the Hürtgen Forest on the other side and he was killed there. So there you go. Small, small world. <laughs> small world. <laughs> but anyway... Um, as I got to know people and I got their stories, it's all stuck in the back of my mind. And um, I realized early on, of course, it should be expected, the German perspective of the war and things were different from ours. And um, so these ideas were percolating in my head for years and years, all through my years as a teacher, teaching foreign students and dealing with more German people and so on. And when I started writing my books, I tried to retell these experiences through my fictional characters. So my characters in my books are really composites of a lot of people that I knew. And uh, I'm, I'm attempting, if you could say I have a mission, my attempt is to answer the question, how could something like the Holocaust happen in a, a country like Germany? And... I hope that I've been able to shed some light on that and bring a, a level of understanding. Um, and also with the thought in mind that if people can see how such a monstrosity as national socialism or Nazism can overtake a modern country, uh, and I hate to say this, but I think that we can see some parallels in our own time. Right. I was just going to get to that part where I'm hearing a lot about it, where it's like you're seeing things that um, I, I it, it's really hard to put into words that what happened uh, during that time in Germany, what's happening here. And of course, you hear all these things about all oh, the floor constitution. We're going to um, provide everybody with this, everybody with that. And, you know, what Hitler, you know, offered back then. And of course, I'm surprised that I haven't heard this yet, where, you know, 
Adolf Hitler, you know, he thought the Volkswagen Beagle was great. And it's like everybody's car promoting it. And I think uh -huh. to myself, is that going to happen here? So I think I'm seeing kind of some parallels in the sense, which it is a little dicey right now at this point. Yeah, it is. And, you know, at the time I started writing these books, the first one in 2019, um, I guess I'd kind of fallen into the mentality of a lot of people. Oh, you know, we're just kind of done with old fashioned 20th century dictators like Hitler. And then, of course, we know what happened two years ago in Ukraine. And I said, whoa, why do I have this feeling of deja vu? What does this remind me of? Oh, yeah, this kind of reminds me of 1938. Hitler says, oh, I have to go into the Satan land to help the poor ethnic Germans who are being picked down and persecuted by the Czechs. Putin says, oh, I have to go into Ukraine to help protect the ethnic Russians who are being persecuted by the Nazi Ukrainians. Ooh. And I thought, whoa, is that a parallel? You, you know what? You, you hit something about the uh, the Czechs as well, too. You, you hear most about from um, you know Allied point of view, it started like with France, England, and all that. But starting with the Czechs, that was unbelievable. And what was that one event that simply prompted Hitler to say, hey, I'm going to go help the Czechs. Was there anything wrong with them? Czechoslovakia, where it's like a crisis, or he said, like, just walk in just like it. He goes, Hey, I'm here to help, but really, no. Well, you know, the thing is, if you know, he walked into the Rhineland in 1937, that was his first big test. I read some uh, excerpts from diaries of German officers who said that the directive was if the French make one move, you get back over the Rhine, don't challenge them. So that was his first litmus test. The second one was the next year, goes into Austria. Anschluss attaches Austria to the German Reich. Oh, that went well. Well, how about try, let's see, Czechoslovakia. Let's see what we can do there. So but then we have the Sudeten thing. Guess what? The man representing allied interests comes home, Chamberlain I'm talking about, waving a paper and says, I have secured peace in our time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Well, we know what the upside of that was. But nevertheless, the parallels that I think are significant is to what I've come to identify is that, you know, dictators have an agenda that's very interesting and very clear if we really take a look. You know, a dictator like Hitler or Putin or any other one you want to name, they, uh, they see opportunities in chaos. You've heard the mm -hmm. saying, never let a crisis go to waste. Hitler said at one time, I can't remember where I read this quote. I could look it up. But I remember him saying, after the collapse of the stock market in 1929, which brought on the worldwide depression, and on, from 1929 to 1933 were the happiest years of my life. Why? Really? Because, because Germany was in absolute a chaos. I mean, this is a country that in 1914 was the third largest economy in the world. Very rich, very prosperous, also very threatening to Britain and France, I might point out, which had a lot to do with bringing on the war. But uh, in 1929, Germany was so prostate, the depression had uh, was more severe in terms of economic disability in, than it was in the United States. But here's the here's the interesting uh, upshot. We, we, we have to admit that when Hitler took over in 33, as he was appointed by President Hindenburg as chancellor, and that's another whole story. But anyway, he turned the country around in three years. From 1933 to 1936, he, he basically rescued Germany from the Depression. The Depression lasted another five years in this country, okay? Mm -hmm. And many people began to think, oh, well, maybe this guy Hitler's got something. As a matter of fact, when the Olympics came in 36, people who went there were just impressed all over the place with the new Germany and the new autobahns, the freeways, the yaddy yaddy, the And, I mean, and, and the stadiums and, and, and everything. Yes. And of course, the yeah. athletes coming out. Yes, that's right. And I, I had a friend who attended the 36 Olympics who said that people were saying, 
if Hitler had died right after the 36 Olympics, before all of the nightmare with the Holocaust and stuff really took off, he might have gone down in history as a great leader. Hmm. So, you know, who's to say? It? That's speculation. But the mm. point I'm trying to make is, is that he had a huge impact on Germany's image in the world in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess if I were to say a, 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 a final thought of what I hope people take away from my books, I hope that they can see these parallels and see that we could look for red flags in our own time and also, we could ask ourselves the question, um, how would we uh, operate? How would we react in those circumstances? We'd like to think that we're good people, that we're righteous, that we wouldn't respond the way the Germans did to Nazism. But we have to really think about what the circumstances were for them. And uh, that's why I have the motto on the front of my books that says, a man's inhumanity to man belongs to no race and carries no passport. I don't think any nationality or any group is immune to horrible reactions to circumstances, given whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that this, in, in 1945, after we saw the, the newsreels, we were saying, oh, that must be a German thing. No, it's not a German thing. It's a human thing. And I should also add that I don't think that what's happening in, in Ukraine is a Russian thing. It's the regime. It's the people who are pushing the buttons and pulling the levers. Hmm. And, and that's the same thing that happened from an Allied point of view. The Allies are pretty much you know, pressing the buttons, pulling the levers, turning the knobs and everything, putting a spin. But then the Germans just had a totally different view of some of the events. And what are some of the events from an actual point of view instead of an Allied more with author James Cloud of Bra the Brainberg series. But first, listen to the Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, International Warring Author Mia Mosenzia. If you love fast based mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Mosenzia, available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Mosin has garnered great reviews. And Evil Evan and George by Howard Celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and Manales. So grab your copy today for Goes Missing by Mia Mosin Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com on our 40 podcast platforms. Heard in 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Also, Apple Music, Odyssey. Make sure you subscribe on BitChute, Rumble, YouTube, and Follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, and more. Take us with you on any mobile device as well. Also on Facebook. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Wagner Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies. Makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Wagner Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Slash me and Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles. Also T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash me and Molson Zia. Check it out today and support the Mike Wagner Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the Mike Wagner Show.com. We're here with the uh, ma amazing author and retired educator, more than 30 years experience, James Cloud, here on the Mike Wagner Show. And before we go back to talking about the um, Bradenburg series, the first one, A Story of Berlin, and the second, The Ninth Circle of Hell. And you've been teaching for about 30 years experience with um, history, government, U.S. citizenship preparation german and english as a second language and um you know tell us more about teaching what inspired you and and basically it's like why is it important to uh, you know prepare for coming to us as a citizen that's got to be very important especially right now i'm sorry did you ask a question i missed something there 
Oh no, that's okay. Um, that uh, that uh, you you taught history, government, U.S. citizenship preparation, and uh, you know a bit more about that and the story behind it, and of course, especially with um, U.S. citizenship preparation, it's it's more important to do that right now. Well, that was part of a, a package that a program that I had, particularly in in Ogden, Utah. Uh, I taught first at the uh, at uh, Weber State uh, University, and then later I taught in the Weber School District. And uh, I had students who were, yeah, preparing to take their citizenship tests, which meant we had to go into American history and government. And, and of course, I was uh, teaching it from the standpoint that America is a great country, which I believe. And... Uh, my students were well prepared to hear that. I I can't imagine trying to struggle with that in today's what's going on in education. I don't feel qualified to comment on that to any great extent. Mm -hmm. But in, in my day, I mean, it was it was not there was no question that we lived in a great country. Mm -hmm. And I tried to always impressed this on my students. And they were very receptive to that idea. They had voted with their feet. And that's why they were here. Mm -hmm. And and very important as well, too. And do you think uh, today's students would be um, open to uh, learning about uh, Germany uh, as we speak here? I beg your pardon? Do you, oh, think, that... uh, do you think today's people would be open to uh, hearing more about Germany? I think so. I think this whole question of the the tragic phenomena of Hitler's is still, uh, uh, there's a lot of curiosity about that. I mean, you see a lot of replay of, of uh, not just war movies, but you see replay of things pertaining to that. And I think also in connection with that, uh, you know, it hasn't been, well, what? Not too many years anyway, 20 years since the wall came down. And, uh, that was an example of a situation I had the I, I considered myself uh, a great opportunity to be able to spend time in East Berlin and East Germany. I did that in the course of my work as a translator for the British military mission, but also I began to build relationships and friendships with people in East Germany. And I saw some very interesting, parallels between Nazi Germany and the regime in East Germany. Uh, that brings me around to a point I'd like to discuss for a minute. The idea of that's being kicked around, we hear a lot about it in, in political discussions and so forth about freedom. Well, I grew up under, I think I understood freedom as many Americans understood freedom. But the word freedom today has diverged into so many interpretations that I think it, it's interesting to point out what I saw in East Germany was the question of freedom. I mean, when I really looked close at life in East Germany, uh, the basic necessities were pretty well taken care of. They were well fed. They were housed in reasonably dis decent housing. They were reasonably well-dressed. Their basic necessities were taken care of. So could I, we say that they had enjoyed a, a variety of freedom? Yes, they had freedom from real want. But when we talk about freedom in the sense of freedom of expression or freedom of opinion, or freedom of movement, that wasn't there. The freedom of independence, of entrepreneurship, of experimenting, striking out like we've been wont to do as Americans to try our luck doing something on our own, start a new business, or go west, young man, or, all or, of that sort or, of or thing. Or become an author like yourself, too. So. Pardon? Opportunity. Or, or an author like yourself. Yeah, that's right. If you wanted to be an author in a country like Nazi Germany or to a great extent in East Germany, you were working within very strict, prescribed 
guidelines. You knew how far you could go. You knew how what you could say. You know who to mention and what and who not to mention. And so, yeah, freedom from want that was taken care of. But the other freedoms that, well, of course, I can afford to say that at the end of my life, <laughs> are, having are you, had a are career. You, oh, you're free but, to say whatever you want. We're not going to persecute you. Don't well, worry about well, it. <laughs> what I was going to say, freedom uh, from want is not one of my primary concerns anymore. <laughs> but uh, the freedom to live my life and to move around as I've chosen to do, to do, that freedom was taken away from people in Nazi Germany or mm -hmm. in East Germany or I think in Putin's Russia today. Oh, yes. And um, and, and getting in before we get to uh, Putin's Russia as well, too. And what about West Germany and what was uh, life like over there? Not from an ally point of view or any press service or anything like that. You know, West German in the West German point of view. What was the state well, of that compared West to East German, Germany? West Germany, of course, at the time I lived there was in a, in a, I could say we're in a state of recovery from World War II. Many of the people who had been the adults and people in charge during Nazi times were still there in the 60s and early 70s when I lived there. And uh, there was always the question of how many of them had been Nazis and so on. But what I observed was the, the majority of younger people especially in Germany, asked the same question that we were asking in 1945. They asked it about their own country and about their own people. How did such a thing happen here, such as the Holocaust? And I even, have, I even saw divisions in generations over that question. I remember one time at the, in the, uh, the Arts Institute where I was going to school, I heard a couple of young fellows saying, well, what are you going to do for Christmas? One guy says, I'm not, I'm just staying right here. He says, oh, you're not going home to visit your folks? Nah, I don't have anything to do with my parents. Oh, really? How come? Oh, well, they were Nazis. Oh. So, I mean, that was a, that had divided families. I saw it at the time I lived there. And of course, most of the people who lived during the Nazi times are gone now. So that issue is no longer there. But I, I was watching the other night uh, a survey happening in Russia when these, these people were going out to people on the street and asking their opinion, which I thought was pretty risky business, but I guess they're still <laughs> doing it in some cases. Walking up to people and saying, well, what do you think of the war? Or what do you think of Putin? Or what do you think is happening in Ukraine? It was very interesting. Older people would either walk away say, I have no comment, or once in a while they'd say, well, I think, I think our, 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 our Putin is, is a great leader, and I think that what he's doing is absolutely right. But you'd, you'd see young people answer the same question with a smile, and maybe they'd say, <laughs> well, I can't really talk about that too much. But by virtue of the fact through their body language and their smile, you got a pretty good impression they weren't really excited about what was happening there. Mm -hmm. So I did some research on the net afterward, and I followed up. And sure enough, I found something that uh, was not too surprising. The generation over 60 in Russia were very similar to the older Germans I knew in the 60s in Germany. The ones who had grown up during the Nazi years and the Russians who had grown up during the Soviet years. They had wow. both. They had both been subject to enormous, ongoing propaganda. They had been so programmed by Nazi and communist propaganda that that changed them for a lifetime. They'll never recover from that. They'll never be able to really feel free to open up because they grew up in a time when you didn't do that. That was life threatening, mm -hmm. and so. Th that, again, goes back to what I, I think is the question of what is freedom and what does it mean to people? The freedom to speak your mind. We take that for granted in this country. And it's even ab abused. In abused. I was just going to get to that point. To a point, to a point of abuse, you can do whatever you're on social media, which is probably more contamin contaminating and more damning pretty much. 
Yeah, but but if 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 we're going to stay true to our principles, as much as it makes us grind our teeth, <laughs> we cannot. We must avoid at all costs stepping in and removing that freedom from those people, even people we bitterly disagree with. Otherwise, we cease to live up to the principles of our founding fathers. Mm -hmm. it, it also made me think a point, too, like with um, Germany as well, too. Of course, we're going to continue with the whole ally point of view written you know by the press outside germany and all the news sources and everything and of course when it came to hitler you know in germany what was uh hitler like back in the day when he, when he talked to the uh, actual german people you know was he like um an entrepreneur or was he like going to just um just destroy capitalism outright or was his version of capitalism it just simply went wrong well the thing is the whole term national socialism which is the official name for nazism is really uh it's not a good real uh, the true description of the of the system because um yes there were a lot of socialist aspects to nazism but the whole nazi economy was really built on a capitalist principle i mean the 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 a lot of the contributors to Hitler's uh, uh, government economically were the great industries that still exist today. Daimler-Benz, the Mercedes company, mm -hmm. Siemens. Uh, I could go on and on and on. They're still there. I worked for Siemens myself. They have a dark history during the Holocaust years, just like all of the German industries. So to really say that the, the Nazis were anti-capitalist is not really accurate but they exploited capitalism and the capitalists uh, uh and the the great families the head of the capitalist companies they, they allowed themselves to be exploited and some of them were of course sympathetic to hitler and contributed willingly so it, it's a very murky complex issue it's not a it's not easy to unravel it mm -hmm. but uh, I, I, I got an impression that um, a lot of people were just kind of, I, I, I'm, of course you had, I, I did encounter some people who still defended Hitler, older people who said, well, he, you know, yeah, Hitler was, Hitler got involved in some bad things, but it was probably because of some of the people around him. Hitler didn't or, or, know. Or like around the Valkyrie circle and all that. Well, yeah, kind of. The uh, uh, Himmler, Goering, Goebbels, the 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 top Nazis. Uh, some uh, some apologists would like to lay the blame on them and divert it from Hitler. Well, of course, I listened to this and I didn't argue because I don't agree with that at all. Because and and once in a while I would even raise the question. Oh, well, did you read Mein Kampf? Uh most Germans had to t truthfully admit, no, I haven't really. I've kind of looked at it. I don't know if you've tried to look at mine now, but it's tough to uh, read. It's, it's very dark and, and yeah. very difficult and complicated. Oh. And most people are not going to force themselves through that. No, no. It's like going down the rabbit hole. And even um, even former President Donald Trump uh, read about Mein Kampf. And I thought to myself, is that going to be the next thing? And I was going to get you a question as well to you. You made parallels about Russia, Putin, and um, everything like that. Do you think this principle is going to happen to America? Do I think what? Do you think this principle is going to happen in America or to America? Well, I don't want to pretend to be a prophet. And I am I especially don't want to be a prophet of doom. All I'm saying is that people need to spend a little more time uh, – doing some deep thinking and some deep reading and really taking a hard look at what's happening around here and not jump to quick, easy uh, conclusions. Oh, well, this is that and that's that because it's easy to fall into that trap. You want to agree with the cr group that agrees with you. Right, that's like on social nature. media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and all yeah. that. <laughs> and you can read that, that and you can read their comments and you can see that 
regardless of whether we're talking about left, right, in the middle, whatever, these groups gravitate to one another and they feed off of each other and they keep the narrative going. And that's kind of what people just do because you want reinforcement that you're right. You want to hear it from other people that, yeah, you've got it figured out. I mean, we all like to be stroked. But if we're going to really try to examine the problems of our situations we're in today, we need to step back and take a deep breath and spend a little more time reading the backstories. The backstories are not usually that interesting, so that's why a lot of people don't go there. It's not that much fun. <laughs> well, it, that is like little eye candy, ear candy, and everything like that. Because you, then again, the books back in the day, there was none of that ear candy, eye candy. It was just straight book, plain language, and you had to read it. Well, I've just tried in the book. I haven't tried to candy coat candy coat anything, and I've touched on some things in my books that are not pleasant reading. But I didn't feel that I could, if I'm going to try to tell the whole story, I had to try to tell the whole story. And I'm trying to tell it from the point of view of fiction through the eyes of German people living through those circumstances in those times, which I say are composites of people I really knew. And so I don't know how successful I've been at this, but, uh, I'm, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I am I, I am interested in uh, throwing light onto the phenomena of the rise and success and end of Hitler. But I'm also now, because as I said, I didn't realize that this was going to be part of my mission when I started out. But now, in light of what's happening today, I would also invite people to read my books with that thought in mind of drawing some conclusions and parallels of what happened then and what's happening maybe today. Mm hmm. And, and of course, what are some of the other parallels that you've seen? We already talked about um, the rise and fall of Hitler and uh, Nazism and um, also the treatment of Jews as well, too. And um, you talk to actual Germans and um, and 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 they, they got along fine with with the Jewish people. But what was the whole narrative of Hitler you know, coming in to uh, wipe out the Jews? Was it a bad experience on his part or was just um, uh, well, how that's do I a say it? just like. Yeah, people ask that question a lot, and I don't claim to be an expert to answer it completely to, to everybody's satisfaction. But, you know, I have to really be quite honest and point out that, you know, when I was involved in my work at Cal State, and I, uh, I had two majors, German linguistics and uh, German literature, particularly German literature of 19th century romanticism. And when you get involved in German literature, you see glimpses of anti-Semitism that was not just in Germany, but in Western Europe. Well, not even Western Europe, just say Europe in general. It goes back centuries. Wow. Hitler didn't invent anti-Semitism. He just expanded on it and uh, uh, exploited it and amplified it. Um, but he... Why was he so anti-Semitic? There's a lot of speculation that uh, he, he, oddly enough, when he was trying to uh, be an art, artist in Vienna, he was befriended by an old Jewish man who fed him and clothed him and took him in. Now, I don't know much about that experience. It's, there's not much uh, that, that has been written about it, but it's been alluded to. So where did Hitler's anti-Semitism come from? Or was he really in his heart a real anti-Semite? He, he, he claimed to be, but there's also the aspect that, um, like I said, a dictator looks for a scapegoat. And the Jews were handy. And I think that had a lot to do with the anti-Semitism in Germany. What's happening today, I, I think, is driven by other motives uh, I think because of all of this Palestinian stuff and the question of what's going on there and everything. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for this anti-Semitism going on today that I don't understand, but I can kind of see a little bit of it's driven by current politics and, and current events. Mm -hmm. But where Hitler's anti-Semitism came from, I don't, I don't 
claim to know all the answers, but he he definitely um, expanded on it. And he decided, well, you know, some people talk about genocide. Well, genocide here, and this is genocide, and that's genocide. That's another term I think people have to be a little careful with because uh, we hear people talk about genocide in, 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 in Gaza. Uh, I'm not quite reluctant to accept that as genocide. It's a tragedy. And it's a horrible outcome of war and conflict. Oh my gosh! But yeah, that I can't was really, I can't really call it genocide because true genocide, like the Nazis ex understood genocide, was a calculated, designed, architect, uh, arch architect-driven program from before it actually was implemented. Of this is what we're going to do we are going to eliminate a race and this is how we're going to do it. It was very thoroughly thought out and they called it the final solution. Mm. But that's genocide. When you you have the intent, either maybe not even as the result of war, but for whatever reason, you have the intent to exterminate another race of people and you plan it. That's genocide, and that's what the Nazis did. Wow. That was something. I'm glad you really put the light on that. And, um, and, and of course, you know, a bit more about the uh, Bradenburg books with uh, James Cloud. And um, what, what else we know about? We'll find out in just one minute. You listen to The Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios, and brought to you by our official sponsor, The Mike Wagner Show, international warring author, Mia Molson, Dan Missing. We'll be back with author James Cloud of Bradenburg and Bradenburg 2 after this time. We're back with author James Cloud of uh, Bra Brandenburg, a story of Berlin and Brandenburg to the ninth circle of hell here on the Mike Wagner show. And um, you cover the two books really well. And uh, you cover a good portion of uh, Germany being, being told from actual German point of view. And, um, and of course, another question is, um, is there going to be a third book out? Yes, I'm in the, I'm in the third volume. Now I've completed about 25 chapters and uh, it, it's going to continue the story of my characters i've started with four main characters when world war one starts and i take them through the war years and then of course in the interwar years the 20s and 30s we see how they go advance on their careers and start their families and they bring children into the world that leads us into the next generation and during world war ii we see these expanded uh generations and how they interact with uh, the events and i'm going to continue that with the some of my main character original main characters and some of their descendants in the situation in the post-war years in book in volume three and i'm in the uh, period right now of 1946-47 uh, and we're getting ready to talk about the berlin block blockade uh the uh uh, the uh, 17th of June uprising in Berlin uh, that was an unsuccessful attempt to overthrow the uh, East German regime and so on. And eventually we'll end up to the, the wall going up in 1961 and how that affects my characters and their families and their descendants. And I, I'm, at this point, I kind of plan to wrap it up with the wall coming down in 1989 so, yeah, that's kind of a, a thumbnail sketch of what I plan <laughs> in the next volume. I remember the wall coming down. I'll share a little bit of my story. I was working overnight at a radio station outside Chicago, and the news broke around midnight, somewhere around there, that the wall came down. And Reagan even said, um, Gorbachev, tear that wall down after they did that in Russia. They did that in um in, in Germany, when I heard the news, the Berlin Wall came down, I was very happy. I heard the news first at midnight. Yeah. And we thought maybe that we were entering a new golden age of peace and harmony. <laughs> Unfortunately, that hadn't quite proven out to be the case. But... Well, then again, I can ask uh, Angela Merkel. Maybe she give you a different story as long as it's not um, fueled by the Allies. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but you know, she, and I, and I don't agree with all of 
Angela Merkel's politics, but I respect her. And I also respect the fact that she grew up in East Germany in, in, in the DDR. Mm -hmm. And so with her background, I kind of understand a little bit how she was thinking. I mean, she was so adamantly opposed to that regime and she was outspoken in her criticism of the, the regime in East Germany. And it was, it was severe, it was harsh. They didn't, uh, they didn't send people to gas chambers. I, I can say that. Right. But, but they were huh, not people you wanted to mess around with. I mean, I was in and out of East Germany quite a lot. I've got a passport that's so full of East German visa stamps. <laughs> I had to go to the consulate, the American consulate in West Berlin and oh have my. ex- have extra pages glued into my passport. <laughs> <laughs> Probably like an encyclopedia like that. Yeah. Well, you know those old fold-out po picture postcards we used to buy? Oh, you buy yeah. them and they fold out about eight of them, you know? That's the page, extra pages in my passport. They just kind of stretch out. <laughs> yeah. Like like an accordion. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Oh yeah. my gosh, that's too. But I'd like to make a comment if I may, getting back to dictators and so forth, which sure. I, I would tie into what I said the reluctance of older Germans and today older Russians to speak out. I, I think that the older Germans that I knew were not under the constraints of a real threat to their freedom there was nobody going to arrest them i mean west germany was a, a democratic free country when i lived there uh so why were they so reluctant to to get involved in a conversation about the nazi times and hitler and so forth and i don't think it had anything to do with the pressure of the times they lived in with the russians today it's a little different yes they're at, at risk for speaking out but i also think with the older russians a similar pattern took place because of their growing up years, both the people who grew up in Nazi Germany and who grew up in R Soviet Russia. And I'm, I've am i kind of developed some points of how I, this is just kind of something I tossed around the other day of how a dictator takes over and maintains power. First, a dictator looks for uh, chaos. He looks for chaos as an opportunity to move in and civil dis civil disturbance or a war or a, a, a pol political situation or a famine or a pandemic or I mean I, I could go on and on and on. A dictator looks for an opportunity in chaos. Then when he gets sees that opportunity, he moves in and he implements his propaganda barrage. And he begins to absolutely immerse the population in propaganda, incessant, ongoing, daily, daily, day in and day out. And finally softens the population up to the point that they become convinced there's only one valid point of view. Mm -hmm. The next step is to convince them that this point of view is the only valid one. And not only that, any other point of view is invalid and even dangerous. Uh -huh. And the third step is begin to make people suspicious and mistrustful of each other. Try to begin to divide them. Divide and, and conquer, pretty much. And isolate people from each other to better control them and to eliminate the possibilities of exchange of ideas. That's what dictators are afraid of, is the exchange of ideas. They don't want us to get together and compare notes. They want us to not trust each other to do that. Wow. Because there was an expression I learned when I lived in Germany called the uh, German glance. In German, it's called the Deutsche Blick. But anyway, what Deutsche it means Blick. is it was developed during the Nazi times. It applied to the times in East Germany when I was there. And I think it applies in Russia today. The German glance is when you lean forward close to your speaking partner, you lower your voice, and you look over both shoulders before you say anything. That's the German glance. And that's when you have people so mistrustful of each other 
that they really check each other out before they say anything. And the last point is convince them that it is their duty not only to maintain a certain point of view, but to report anyone who demonstrates an opposite or contrary point of view. Oh, wow. It's almost, it's almost like ratting on your neighbor. Yeah. It's like that's where the Gestapo comes in. That's where the KGB comes in. That's where all these secret police organizations and dictatorships come in. That's where the Big Brother syndrome kicks in. Somebody's oh, yeah. watching you. Mm -hmm. Somebody's watching you. And you better be careful because if you don't behave yourself, I'll tell somebody what you're saying. Yeah. So that's how they do it. So with all of that kind of thing, I think that we need to be a little charitable to people who are living in dictatorships like Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia or even Putin's Russia mm -hmm. and ask ourselves, what would we do? in that situation oh we'd like to think we do the right thing oh sure we would yeah would we mm -hmm. if you thought that the choices were either to go along with the status quo live from day to day and keep your mouth shut or speak out and get sent to a concentration camp or even worse bring disaster down on yourself and your family and you all get a bullet in the head if you were reduced to those choices, how heroic would we be? Right, yeah. So in other words, truth is pretty much eliminated. Ah. Fact-checking, eliminated, yeah. you know, thought process, eliminated. That's right. Wow. And that's what that's what I saw was the end result of in in Germany after the war and I saw it played out to my lim in my limited experience in East Germany. I remember one time in East Berlin uh, I had friends in West Berlin who had managed to either escape to West Berlin or who had lived there for, before the wall went up or whatever, but they had relatives in the East. And so I had a kind of a list of acquaintances that when I knew I was going over to East Berlin, maybe with something to do with my job as a translator or whatever, but for whatever reason, I'd be going to East Berlin. I'd call these people up and I'd say, I'm going over to the East today. Do you have anything you'd like me to take over? And they, oh yes, my my uncle in in Weissensee would love some fresh oranges or just Ooh, stuff like that. Oh, that sounds delicious. I'm brave for some right now. Now you're talking food here. <laughs> yeah, and so I would visit people in the east and and sometimes get invited into their homes or their apartment for these reasons. And one time I was in a, a building and a uh, th th very nice couple, very cordial, very hospitable, and the the man said to me oh where, where's your car parked and i had a little volkswagen with west german plates on it mm -hmm. or west berlin plates and i said well it's out in front out in front of the building uh would you mind moving it over maybe a street over or down a block or two i said well sure i'll do that so i did and i came back and i said what was that for and he says well yeah a lot of times the cleaning lady or the the janitor or somebody in the building, not always, but was very often the eyes and ears for the Stasi, the state secret police in East Berlin. Really? Janitor and were they employed took, they, by they, them? They kept track of who was coming and going in the building. These were usually in apartment buildings. And if they saw a car parked in front of the building with West Berlin plates, the next day or so, somebody from the Stasi would maybe be going around knocking on doors. Uh, did you have any visitors from West Berlin in the last day or so? Oh, you did. Uh, who were they? Uh, what were they here for? Why do you have friends in West Berlin? And yadity, yadity, yadity. Oh, on. my gosh. And to us who live the way we've lived, that never occurs to us. But that's how the system worked in Nazi times and in communist times in East Berlin. And I'm sure it works in Soviet Russia and in Putin's Russia today. You wow. don't know who you're talking to. You don't know who's watching you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, again, what I hope people will think about when they read my books, what would I have done in that situation? Mm-hmm. 
And, and that's a very good question to ponder. Where can we find all your uh, books at? Uh, my books are available on Amazon in paperback as eBooks and as an audio version, which was narrated by a good friend of mine, Tom Briggs, who's a retired Lieutenant Colonel of the U S army. On all right. Amazon. All right. Well, certainly check those out. We're here with author James Claude of, uh, Brandenburg, a story of Berlin and the newest Brandenburg uh, to the Ninth Circle of Hell here on the Mike Wagner Show. And um, James, just a few more things. Uh, what else can we expect from you in 2024 and beyond? What What, did, what can you expect? I'm sorry. What else can we expect from you in 2024 and beyond? Well, if I can get the job done, I mean, I wrote the first two books in about 11 months. Wow. And if I can crank myself up to that kind of dedication, I hope to be able to to turn out book three in a reasonable amount of time, hopefully before the end of the year. But I have to mention, I've got a few things going on. I don't know how my time constraints are going to develop. There's a film studio in Berlin, as a uh, 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 coincidentally, a film studio in Berlin that requested uh, my books a couple of, or about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. and some excerpts from some of my books. And so I sent them on my agent, sent them off to, to the studio. And uh, he sent me an email a couple of days ago, the agent did, that he expects to have a, a meeting with them next week to see if they uh, are interested in moving forward on making these books into perhaps a series or a movie. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's going to come out of that. If that were to develop into something, then I might be kind of tied up with that. So I can't oh. make a lot of real firm predictions, but I can express the hope that I would like to finish book three this year. But we're going to have to wait and see. And certainly indeed as well, too. And uh, look forward to having come back on and talk about that. And uh, who do you consider biggest influence in your career, James? The biggest influencer who maybe got me started on all this? Mm -hmm. Sure. I guess it was again going back to the first post-war years. I remember walking into a newsstand there in Las Vegas in the, in the hotel lobby buying paperbacks. I was always an avid reader. I'd go to the library, but take home five books or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, I always loved history and everything. And I saw this paperback on the stand. And of course, I've been interested in the whole German thing because of as how I because of things I explained, you know. And incidentally, I think you saw it in my bio. My first grade teacher was Jewish, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, I was interested in the whole German question, and this was I was about uh, nine or ten. Must have been about nineteen forty nine, maybe forty six or forty seven, and there was this paperback. And it showed a German soldier on the cover, and he was talking to a young woman or something. And I went over and I read the book, uh, the title, and it was All Quiet on the Restaurant Front by Eric Remark. Mm -hmm. Well, I took that book home, and I was just fascinated. Here's a book right after the war by a German author. I never had encountered such a thing before. And I read that book, and I've probably read it uh, half a dozen times since <laughs> over a lifetime. And Eric Remark was a, a veteran. In, he was in the German army in World War I. And he wrote his book from taken from real life experiences through fiction. Mm -hmm. And that probably started me being curious about the Germans on the other side during the war. So I could say maybe Eric Remark's book, All Quiet on the Western Front, maybe got got me going. Ah, that is rather interesting. I like that. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Well, any I would say in general, be watchful. Pay attention to what's going on today. Uh, I don't want to be a doomsday prophet, but I see things happening that I never would have expected in my lifetime. Like mm -hmm. I said, I thought we were done with old-fashioned 20th century dictators. But when I see what's going on today, 
I don't want to say that I see history repeating itself, but I see a dangerous possibility of that. So I would say to people, don't, don't lose sleep over it. Don't ruin your life. Don't become so immersed in this that you can't just go on living. But at the same time, pay attention. And by pay attention, I mean, listen to the arguments, listen to what's being said, and take a lot of it with a grain of salt until you've done enough research to really decide for yourself where you stand with read the backstories. I'd like to say just in one more thing, when I was writing, I would estimate that for every hour that I actually was writing in the books, the novels, the Brandenburg series, I put in probably two to four hours doing research. If I was dealing with a personality or a historical event or a, a place, I tried to make sure I, even if it was outside of my range of experience of living in Germany, I tried to, as much as possible to make sure that I had my facts. It could be something like discussing the production of the uh, German Messerschmitt fighter. And I would describe how that came to buy and blah, 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 blah. And I would go into that in depth. And I wouldn't repeat what I saw in the history books, but I would try to adapt the information to my fictional situation and to my characters. Okay. So research. I'm a great believer in research. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying to people today, do your research. And Facebook does not count. I'm going to say that to people right now, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok doesn't count. No, I'm going to tell you right now. I, I agree. That. I don't, I hate to say it, but I don't really personally do social media. <laughs> I, I kind of backed out of that a few, a few years ago. Right, exactly. And of course, the fact that uh, I'm not into selfies, I'll tell you right now. So that's not evidence right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all kinds of stuff. So we're here with Arthur James Cloud of uh, Brandenburg, A Story of Berlin and Brandenburg too, the ninth uh, circle of hell here on the Mike Wagner Show. Br James, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely amazing. Learned a lot from you. Looking forward to having you again soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. We'd love to have you back. And uh, once again, what's your website? How do people contact you? Where can people purchase or check out your books? Okay, they can check out my books on Amazon. But I also have a website, jamescloudbooks.com. And so they can uh, read my website. And I'm even willing to, to have people contact me on my personal uh, email address if they care to, which is j dot. Z, the last letter of the alphabet, J dot Z dot cloud at hotmail.com. So I'm interested in, in hearing from people. All right. We'll certainly do that as well. Once again, James, a very, very thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. We love having you back. We wish our best. And James, you definitely have a great future to have you. Thank you again. I appreciate it.